Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first webinar in the Soil Health and Organic Farming webinar series brought to you by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic. This is your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. The webinar will last between 45 minutes and an hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. We're expecting a large audience today, but we will answer as many questions as we have time for after the webinar is over. I'm very pleased to welcome our presenters today, uh, Mark Schoenbeck and Diana Jerkins. Mark has worked for the last 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator about organic and sustainable agriculture. He's the research program associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and he also works with the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. Diana Jerkins is the Research Program Director of the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and she also has decades of experience in agricultural research, administration, and farming. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand the screen control over to our first presenter, who is Diana. So let me just get that transferred here. Here we go. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we are certainly glad to be sponsoring this. Organic Farming Research Foundation is a 30-plus year old national organization that supports organic farming, uh, the improvement and of, of the principles and practices in those, and also policy um, activities related to organic farming. Um, one of our uh, hot topics right now is soil health. Uh, we have been doing a lot of research, supporting research, and uh, writing about research uh, and adaptive management practices for soil health. So this is the first in a series, as Alice said, about different aspects of soil organic matter and related practices. And today we will um, give an overview of information about that. Okay, Alice. Um, we did a survey in 2016 of over a thousand uh, certified organic farmers uh, to find out what is their research needs. And we do this periodically uh, because we want to be able to support research in those needed areas as well as support uh, other organizations uh, like USDA to do that kind of work. 74% of the Respondents cited soil health and quality as their highest priority, and 66% cited fertility and nutrient management. So this is probably the hot topic, and this was for all regions in the U.S., and this report, as well as all information, is publicly available on our uh, OFRF.org site. Some of the research questions that came out uh, that farmers and ranchers were looking at uh, related to soil health was what is the best rotations, cover crops, amendments that should be used to maintain and improve soil health? What are the best practices for the different regions, different soils, different climates, and different farming systems? Uh, so many of our reports uh, regionalize uh, this information because it does make a difference of what you're growing. Uh, what your temperature and rainfall is and the type of crop. So we have tried to uh, have generic information as well as more specific information to those regions. Practical field measurements. How can that be done by farmers and ranchers that are as easy, timely, uh, out in the field? And those methods are evolving rapidly, uh, but still um, regular soil tests can be done through the laboratory. How does one restore depleted soils, rebuild soil health, especially during organic transition for three years? How do you minimize negative impacts of tillage? Because tillage is generally used by most organic farmers. And how does one enhance resilience to weather extremes and climate change by improving the soil organic matter? So these are major research questions and uh, application practices that organic farmers want to know about in, or, in uh, farming and improving their soil health. Okay. So in addition to these webinars, we have produced um, uh, nine, or will have nine, we have eight published now, and, and the ninth one is, in, is being written in different aspects of soil health. Again, this will, is on our website. Uh, today we are going to base this webinar on one of these um, um, uh, publications that we've done. Um, and we think that this is a good basis to start with because 
uh, if you have a healthy soil, generally this uh, will lead to less disease, less nutrition problems. Uh, all the many problems are really based in good soil health management. Okay. Future webinars then will look at the different aspects uh, related to practices to soil health. So we hope you stay tuned and will join us for those. And we address many of the topics that you see here um, and uh, more specifically to these aspects of, of breeding and weed control, the tillage, et cetera. So today is an overview. Okay. So what is soil health? What is the role of soil organic matter? Uh, this, again, is the basis of, of uh, management practices as an organic farmer and rancher. Okay. Healthy soils. What, how is healthy soils defined? Well, a healthy soil will provide uh, sufficient but not excessive plant nutrients. If you have excessive plant nutrients, both environmentally and economically, this is a waste uh, in time and labor and expenses to lose nutrients through leaching or um, aeration, uh, volatilization in, into the air. A healthy soil will retain and recycle nutrients, and they will definitely protect water quality. Many research projects have shown this time and time again, that improved soil organic matter or high levels of soil organic matter protects and retains water quality better than those with lower levels of SOM. It hosts abundant and diverse microbial, um, macro and microarthropod populations in the soils, and it will allow few pests and pathogens to develop within healthy soils and therefore in the plants. Um, healthy soils will enhance crop resistance to diseases and resistance to diseases and pests and weather extremes. And overall, it will require less inputs to sustain those yields because you're self-cycling, in a sense, uh, of what you have on farm and improving that soil organic matter to sustain uh, longer term over the productivity of uh, your farming practices and the crops that are being grown and animals that are being grown. Healthy soil, uh, and you uh, probably, if you've ever looked at a soil, Textbook, we'll see these diagrams that are up in the corner. Healthy soils uh, have a certain structure, tilth, and that's the crumb structure or the aggregation within that. How, how much are the different soil particles? Uh, do you have a network of large and small pores that promote drainage and aeration? Because a saturated soil is not a good soil, uh, a soil that um, allows too much air and not promoting enough and retention of water is also not good. So a balance should be obtained there by how much, and the organic matter is that uh, mechanism that does allow for a good balance between pores, open space, water retention, and soil structure. Uh, healthy soil absorbs and retains uh, plant available moisture longer, uh, especially in drought conditions. It fosters deep and extensive root system development. We're going to talk a good bit about uh, the importance of roots in, uh, related to soil structure and soil health. And it resists compaction and erosion and recovers from effects of disturbances. This is especially important in transitioning uh, soils. So good soil health management maintains and enhances each of these vital soil functions year to year and yielding sustained long-term return on investment, which is uh, important. Uh, so our, if you're using a sustainable system, you're looking at environmental practices and economic practices to promote sustainability. Plant and soil depend on each other. Uh, a healthy soil relates, as I said earlier, to healthy plants and they work together to provide benefits above ground and below ground. Plant root exudates are the, the juices, if you might want to say it that way, that come off of, out of the uh, roots of the plants and the fine root hairs that break off and degrade or slough, provide primary sources of food to the soil life in nature and in sustaining farming. So these exudates, the carbohydrates that plant give off, and the roots are the basic 
food of life to all the organisms that live in the soil. So without living plants and living roots, um, you don't have living organisms in the soil. Beneficial microbes thrive in the plant root zone. And this is the area right around where the roots are in the upper surface of the soil and it enhances nutrient and water uptake and, compri and comprise the foundation of plant nutrition available to these microbes. So it's a symbiotic relationship uh, between the roots, the microbes, and the microarthropods that live there. So a healthy soil, there's a relationship that is optimized through sufficient soil organic matter. It enhanced microbial diversity and deep extensive root systems are abundant in a high or sufficient level of soil organic matter. Various fractions from very active, which turns over in days to months, to highly stabilized, which turns over in centuries to millennial of soil organic matter, play different vital roles in supporting the plant, root, soil, organism ecosystem. So we're looking at each of these uh, plants and their relationship to the soil, where they are in the soil, as a mini ecosystem. Okay. Soil organic matter, and sometimes it's called SOM, is compromised of four primary components. We've already been talking about the plant and animal residues that are uh, provided. Uh, that will degrade and go into the soil, the soil life itself, the active soil organic matter then uh, is recently dead soil organisms and their met metabolites. And this is readily available to future processing by soil life. This, so this is the most active or usable part of organic matter, both for the soil organisms and also for plant uptake. Several forms of stable organic matter are also there. So you'll see there's about an equal proportionality between the actively decomposing, functioning soil organic matter segment and uh, the long-term stable organic matter, which is sometimes called humus or humic availability. This portion of the SOM is protect, protects the soil aggregate. It keeps the soil structure uh, the way you want it to be. It is absorbed to soil clay or mineral particles, sometimes as a coating, sometimes as a layer. It goes deeper in the soil profile generally, and it's chemically resistant to degradation. So this is the part that stabilizes the soil itself. Plant and animal residues incorporated into the soil by field operations or by earthworms or other macroorganisms help promote these different levels of soil organic matter. The stable is the one that does protect the most. The other, again, as I said, the active is what functions for the microorganisms and the plants themselves. The role of soil organic matter in the function of healthy soils. Why is it so important? Well, again, it retains, recycles, and cycles and delivers plant nutrients. So not only does the plant feed the soil, the soil then feeds back to the plant. Soil organic matter is the component that absorbs and retains this plant available moisture. It maintains the tilth, aeration, and easy root penetration. This is very important, particularly uh, in areas where I live, like in the south, which have very heavy clays. Uh, and other areas where there's a lot of tillage and you have a compacted area uh, or a clay pan where it's very difficult for the roots of the crops to penetrate. So the level of soil organic matter is extremely important in those situations in order to allow root penetration and not create these impenetrable areas. SOM prevents runoff, erosion, and compaction. It keeps that tilth, the aggregation of the soil in a healthy um, way so that it does not compact. It provides food and habitat for a great range of diversity in soil organisms, which in turn transforms fresh residue into soil organic matter. 
And lastly, it enhances crop resilience and resistance to stress. Uh, a common saying that I grew up with, a healthy soil is a healthy plant, and a healthy plant uh, lives in a healthy soil. So it's very, again, symbiotic in that relationship. Soil life provides slow-release nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other nutrients as it processes fresh residue and active soil organic matter. The stable soil organic matter contributes to carbon exchange capacity, which holds potassium, magnesium, calcium, ammonium nitrate, and other positive charged micronutrients. Active soil organic matter provides food for soil life, and stable, again, provides a habitat for the organism and the tilth of the soil. Okay? So how do we build soil organic matters? What are some practical guidelines uh, that allow us to do this? Okay. The Natural Resource Conservation Service <clears throat> uh, has come up with four principles for soil health, uh, and these are the basic parameters that are, should be considered, <clears throat> excuse me, in thinking about what are the minimal activities for uh, enhancing and maintaining soil health. Uh, the best practice is to keep the soil covered as much as possible year-round. Living roots throughout the year, again, provides uh, nutrition to those microbes uh, so they can be active in their functionality. And diversity of crops enhances uh, different types of soil microbes and then provides diversity in those systems. So minimizing soil disturbance is also the fourth principle, <clears throat> whether it's physical, chemical, or biological disturbance. Um, and this, in some instances in organic farming, can have some trade-offs because, again, uh, most organic farmers have some level of tillage for weed control. Okay. So the living plant is the farmer's another more on tool for soil organic matter, building it, uh, contributing to it, and maintaining it. Uh, the carbon through photosynthetic activity comes into the plant and goes, uh, as we talk, through the roots to provide nutrients to the soil organisms. Uh, it protects the soil surface from drying out, compaction, uh, wind, and rain erosion. Uh, it builds soil organic matter and enhances soil structure. And the plant feeds the soil life uh, and opens the subsoil if you have uh, deep-rooted plants uh, and builds stable SOM throughout the soil profile, not just on the surface. So the central theme here is that living plants are the farmer's primary soil health management tool. Thus, cover crops, and we will do a section on cover crops uh, in one of the series, plays a pivotal role in maintaining the health of cropland soils. Integrating perennial sod, for example, can be especially effective in building active SOM um, and total soil organic matter, if that's possible. Okay. Plant roots. Uh, we were just talking about the upper uh, portion of the plant uh, providing to soil organic matter. Plant roots are just as important. And uh, plant root biomass, uh, if you look at an oak tree or any plant, uh, I always think that what I see above ground, there's two to three times that biomass below ground. So it's not insignificant. So plant roots play a vital role in building soil organic matter. They deliver between 10 and 30 percent of their photosynthetic product to the below ground. Uh, the root residues are converted to soil organic matter more efficiently, 30, 40 percent better than above ground residues when they decompose, which only are 15 to 20 percent addition to SOM. Mycorrhizal fungi and other root symbionts facilitate this process, as we've been talking about. And roots build SOM from the surface to the subsurface as they go down, depending on the root depth that we are looking at. Roots build SOM. Um, recent findings have shown that most of the stable uh, SOM is derived from the plant roots. And we saw earlier in the, in the pie chart that the stable portion is equal to the active portion. And organic systems has been shown to actually grow larger roots. 
So most grasses and legumes form strong microbial associations. So if you can add those to your diversification, it is good. And root symbiotic uh, mycorrhizal fungi facilitate formation of stable SOM and can comprise 25% of the soil microbial biomass. So there is a difference in the type of microbes you have and the type of inputs that the roots provide. Root systems of many cover crops extend to a depth of four to eight feet, including tillage, radish, forage, turnips, pearl mullet, sorghum, Sudan grass, sun hemp, sweet clover, alfalfa, bahia grass, and many other perennial leg legumes and grasses. So these crops deliver soil organic throughout the soil profile, profile without your labor and soil disturbance of tillage. So this is a good mechanism to achieve that. In Denmark, wheat and barley grew 60% more root biomass when grown organically than when grown in conventional fertilized uh, systems. So that's kind of an interesting research uh, finding. Okay. It's important, if you can, to have a diverse plant community, uh, which builds soil uh, diversity. This can be done uh, at one time or over time if you have different crops in succession, uh, because oftentimes you can't have multi-species unless you're using cover crops. Um, so the up top uh, structure architecture, the height, the, the leaf uh, area index, and then the root structure, makes a difference as to what types of microbes are being uh, provided for and also the above ground soil surface as we talked about before being covered or not being covered and maintaining that soil surface uh, in a good environment. So the more diversity you can have, the more diversity in your microbial populations. Okay. Multiple studies have shown that cover cropping, increasing crop diversity, living root mass, and and percent of year in living plant cover all enhance SOM. Organic systems that integrate several of these practices often accrue 500,000 pounds of SOM per acre annually. Microbial fungi help stabilize SOM while high levels of soluble nitrogen phosphorus can promote soil organic breakdown, which has been shown in conventional systems with uh, these high inputs. So we're talking and striving for a primary soil organic matter building through sustainable intensification. Um, the term intensification has been of recent used in different formats, but we can use it in a positive way in building um, soil organic matter by having year-round plant cover, diversity of crop rotations, reduced tillage, and the types of organisms that are uh, grown literally grown below ground, okay? Primary soil organic matter is important also in livestock and animal production, and we have management intensive rotational grazing, or MIG. These come under different terms, mob grazing, holistic resource management, adaptive multi paddock grazing. When you do this type of rotational grazing, it affects the forage biomass and quality, it affects how deep the roots can grow. Manure nutrients can be distributed more evenly, uh, not causing leaching and, and um, inadequate distribution of uh, fertilizers through manures. And it enhances soil health and moisture infiltration and pasture resistance. As an example, a crude several tons of soil organic matter per acre per year can be done through MIG. Uh, studies in upstate New York, SOM initially at 2.8, went up to 4.0 after three years in MIG. So this is rather a significant change in a very short period of time. Okay. Complementary soil organic matter practices can be done also through organic and mineral nutrient. It doesn't have to be done just through uh, the, the interactions that we've been talking about. But we like to look for closed loop systems. If you do have to bring in amendments uh, and use them, you should use finished compost. I'm going to say this a couple of times because it is the most stable and the best uh, for the microbial and the plant uh, community. Returning on-farm manure and other organic residues in the soil uh, should be done. 
Organic mulches uh, can protect the soil surface, uh, for example, the residue from your vegetable or tree crops. Off-farm organic natural mineral inputs is needed to restore soil balance and replenish nutrients if they're removed from harvest and you don't have sufficient inputs on farm. The use of commercial soil inoculants, again, especially in transition, if needed, is advantageous to restore soil health. Okay. Organic amendments can be beneficial and have pitfalls. Uh, finished compost again, I'll say it again, works with in situ plant biomass to complement and synergize the way that the, the biomass is uh, provided and becomes stable. It provides slow release of nutrients, which is good for plants and for the microbial community and adds diverse uh, beneficial organisms from that compost that are in the compost. Research findings have shown that compost plus cover crops add more SOM and a little compost goes a long way. A few tons per acre annually or a single heavier application every five to 15 years can give near maximal soil health benefits. As an example, in Utah, dry land organic wheat, a single 22 ton per acre dry weight application of manure compost doubled topsoil SOM and enhanced wheat yields for 15 years. Another example in California, a single application to rangeland restored forage vigor, which in turn built SOM far beyond the organic input of the compost itself. The main pitfall is more is not better approach, or more is better approach is the pitfall, which often builds up excess uh, phosphorus, inhibits microbial fungi. It also, very high compost uh, and especially raw manure inputs can result in high levels of soluble nitrogen, which can be leached. Or some organic amendments can also build up calcium and zinc, uh, and these can cause nutritional imbalances. So repeated heavy use of hay or straw mulch can also build up excess potassium, so it is usually not too hard to draw these levels down over the years through different harvests. A second pitfall is importing large amounts of organic matter from off-farm, and therefore then that donor farm is, may get out of balance and reduce its soil health. This is a special concern when native or other perennial vegetation in clear cuts is manufactured for biochar. So soil organic matter accrual represents net carbon sequestration should be mainly done in place. Okay. So challenges to organic farmers in transitioning. What are some tips? All right. What are some of the biggest challenges um, that we have found through experimentation that can help we have found through experimentation there are some things that can help all these different, you can see the different pictures, the challenges uh, to organic farmers, okay? <clears throat> Practices that maximize soil health uh, matter and, and soil health, minimum tillage, high biomass cover crops, and sometimes entail yield tra trade-offs that present farmers with a difficult choice. Tillage, Cultivation is required generally for weed control, but how does that affect the degradation or oxidation of your soil organic matter and degrading your soil aggregate or till? Okay. Friendly tillage, and again, we're going to have a section on tillage, um, uh, but just a few points. Uh, implement an integrated weed management strategy it reduces the need for cultivation. Uh, multiple studies have shown that organic systems with diverse rotation, cover crops, light application, manure, and routine till some routine tillage can build SOM um, better than no-till uh, conventional fertilizer inputs. Okay. Oh, I wanted also on that one, I want to add that uh, the type of machine that you use is important because we've been finding that spading machines or rotary hair and sweet plows that undercuts uh, your cover crops are actually better than the traditional uh, tillage implements that have been used, okay? Some crops require nitrogen more quickly, uh, and so uh, if you do use a concentrated manure such as poached leaf litter, uh, be careful because that can leach nitrogen and accelerate SOM loss, okay? 
Remember that a little compost goes a long way. And when you used in conjunction with cover crops, uh, low application rates that do not build up XSP can build the SOM and maximize soil health. So again, finish compost and then make your own, own compost if possible. Okay. Modern cultivars, and again, we're going to have a section on breeding, are generally bred for high input conventional production. Uh, heritage breed and other older breeds uh, lend themselves more to organic uh, application, but sometimes it may be hard to get those seeds for organic uh, certified producers. So there's a lot of work being done on uh, breeding and the role of genetics in selection. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to bring you more information on this in the future. Okay. And finally, for my section, soil health challenges during transition. New producers, organic producers, do are going to have to learn new mechanisms and approaches and practices about so organic soil, nutrient, weed, and pest management techniques. And they should start by understanding the history of the land that they are on. Uh, that has been conventionally, if it's been conventionally managed, and the problems that they may start with, with compaction or low levels of SOM and depleted or unbalanced soil life and, and the need to build those up. So transitioning growers, probably the first thing and the primary thing they need to do through the three years of transition is find mechanism to build soil organic matter. Uh, we mentioned before that perennial grass legging sod is good for this. Year-round cover crop uh, is effective for restoring soils. And several of the OREI-funded research um, teams are exploring alternative cropping systems during this critical period and generally using crops such as alfalfa and other forages, food-grade soybeans and new perennial grains, uh, wheat grass, to improve that. Integrated livestock grazing and transition also, as we've spoken before, enhances SOM. At this point, we're going to turn, turn it over to Mark, and he's going to talk about soil organic dynamics. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm going to quickly read this quote and then uh, explore it a little further. It's a quote from a, a research uh, article published by Hirisa et al. in the uh, Soil Science Society of America journal. And they're saying that soil organic matter levels are the balance of carbon inputs to the soil uh, through residues and amendments and losses by mineralization, which basically amounts to uh, the microbial respiration. It's just released as carbon dioxide. Uh, and that also releases the nutrients. And these dynamics, stabilization versus mineralization, are mediated through the soil food web or the soil life, which plays a large role in soil organic matter decomposition and thereby supports crop nutrition. Growers have a vested interest in both processes because they rely on mineralization for short-term short -term crop productivity, but they also must maintain sufficient stable organic matter to build and maintain soil resilience and, and the tilth, drainage, and all the other uh, beneficial properties of healthy soil that we talked about earlier. Um, that stable organic matter also contributes to crop nutrition by enhancing the cation exchange capacity of the soil. And for the longest time, I've always thought, well, this seems like quite a trade-off. You need to burn up organic matter to produce your crop, and you need to build organic matter to uh, maintain soil health for the future. And uh, the very interesting thing is that there's a lot of research that shows uh, it's not at all a trade-off, but that in fact, uh, I'm not, there we go. In fact, it's a win-win between these two processes because as good sustainable management improves soil conditions, um, you see an increase both in soil microbial respiration and in total soil organic matter, which means you're getting more turnover and more stabilization at the same time. Uh, and that was based on a review of a number of different studies of organic systems that were managed in various ways in detail, but definitely integrated the living plant as the primary tool for building soil with these other important supplemental practices, such as both finished compost and returning on-farm residues. Uh, there was a study in uh, the Pacific Northwest comparing vegetable production systems, both, or, or, both organic systems, but one used a poultry litter as a basic source of um, brought in fertility. And this is very high 
in nutrients and not that high in carbon. And then they compared that with another system that used a, um, a mixed source compost, a finished compost that had a higher amount of carbon and the same amounts of total nutrients. Yields were similar, but in the system that used the finished compost uh, that had more carbon, the soil accrued considerably more organic matter and um, showed at the same time that increase in soil microbial respiration. And in another meta-analysis of multiple studies, organic fields showed a tremendous increase in microbial meta metabolic activity, and at the same time, a significant in improvement in soil organic matter, uh, total um, SOM. Let's get the wrong button. Let's try that. Okay. There are exceptions to this rule. There are times when an increase in respiration is not a result of a well-fed soil or a well-managed soil, but is an indicator of stress. Conditions that will cause the microbes to do what's called maintenance respiration, just burning off a lot of carbon just to stay alive, as opposed to assimilating organic matter to grow new microbial biomass. Uh, these conditions include heavy tillage, extended bear fallow, like when there's a bear fallow, they're, they're, they're starving, they're not being fed, so uh, the, the soil life is unhealthy. Another condition that can promote the situation is excessive soluble nitrogen. So the standard practice uh, before the age of cover crops, which unfortunately uh, is still true of a good part of conventional production in the corn belt, it's typical to grow a crop for three or four months to, and then harvest the corn or soybeans or wheat and then leave this field fallow for eight uh, six to eight months. During that whole time, you have this imbalance where the soil life is burning off organic matter and it is not being replenished. And so there's a, there's a, a, a ratio called a microbial growth efficiency that researchers use to track this so that in a well-managed organic system, you'll get more respiration. Like if you put a little chamber over the soil and measure it, you say, oh, there's more carbon dioxide coming off. Uh-oh, we're losing CO, we're losing organic matter and we're contributing to climate change, but that's not really true because in the meantime, you have a higher microbial growth efficiency. So you're growing a lot of active organic matter in the form of living and recently dead biomass. And that simply means that the soil is well fed and well cared for. So a few tips on managing this dynamic. It is true that certain practices will tend to favor mineralization and others will tend to favor stabilization. And you really need both to stay in business and to uh, build up your soil organic matter. So just a few tips to remember. When you till in a really succulent legume cover crop, you're going to favor mineralization and nutrient release. In fact, there may be a slight net loss of, to of total soil organic matter um, after such a, um, a practice. Now, if you're going to plant a really heavy feeding crop that's going to snap up that nitrogen, this may not be a bad practice, especially if you're on a, in a cooler climate with a heavier soil where mineralization tends to be slow in the spring. Like the thing I would do is I get right behind that farm there and put, start setting out spring broccoli and and because uh, that's one of the fastest heavy feeders in the uh, uh, whole range of crops being produced. Um Cover cropping and compost together, they'll build more soil organic matter than either practice alone. A number of studies show this over and over. Sometimes the effect is additive and sometimes it's actually synergistic. And there's a lot of subtle things happening in the both chemical and the biological levels that the finished compost supports different functions from the fresh uh, crop, cover crop or crop residue. Uh, and then at the same time, raw manure will sometimes further complement, it'll, it'll support a different set of functions. So sometimes all three practices can, can work together. Again, you need to be careful about your rates with the manure to, uh, to avoid overloading nitrogen or phosphorus. In general, when you have a diversity of inputs, you get a better result. More diverse inputs is similar to more diverse uh, cover crop and crop rotation. You're feeding a more complete range of soil organisms. Um, and you want to combine inputs that are rich in carbon with ones that are rich in nitrogen in that diverse mix. And you'll definitely get a much more lasting uh, benefit to soil organic matter and fertility than mater materials like a manure slurry. In fact, liquid manure or manure slurry will have a very similar impact on soil nutrient dynamics and soil organic matter as 
the um, conventional fertilizers. Like it's like almost like putting on 10, 10, 10 or ammonium nitrate or, or uh, materials like that. So sometimes, like again, if you're growing broccoli, which is this really demanding heavy feeder, you, it, you're gonna if you build up build soil health by really heavily favoring stabilization, but your broccoli doesn't make a crop and you end up going out of business. Um, uh, I would rather have seen a little more mineralization than have the farm get sold and suddenly go uh, uh, sprout subdivisions. So anyway, um, coming back to ways to solve this, there is an approach called soil functional zone management, or uh, it's a fancy term. There was a, a research study that looked at ridge tillage, and ridge tillage forms this the, the, this, the field into uh, narrow beds or ridges, which are on contour and are tilled minimally. Often you'll grow a cover crop, and then in the spring, uh, the cover crop uh, or its uh, winter-killed residues will be kind of sliced off the top. So you're tilling just the top of that ridge and leaving a lot of residue between, and then applying whatever fertilizer you want for your crop, sowing your seed in that row. And then later in the season, when it's time to do one good pass for weed control, there's a shallow tillage that moves the residues back into the row. And the effect of this is that between the row where there's minimal soil disturbance, except for that very shallow cultivation, um, soil organic matter tends to accrue, whereas right in the row where there was that early spring tillage to create the seed bed, and then uh, the residues are later moved back in, you have greater release of nutrients. Other ways to achieve this are simple straight uh, strip tillage on the flat, on the level. Uh, you can also band your organic fertilizers right in the row or use drip irrigation for like uh, intensive vegetable production. You can have a, a drip line down each crop row and the crop's a little hungry, you can deliver some fish emulsion or seaweed extract or, or uh, compost tea and you're not overstimulating the uh, microbes to break down organic matter between the rows. You're allowing that buildup to continue. Another way that's really fascinating is beginning to gain more attention from researchers and farmers is to plant a succulent cover crop that will either winter kill and release its residues quickly, its nutrients quickly in the spring, such as tillage radish in your future crop row. Or you can plant a legume, either one that's going to be um, living and need to be tilled in or one that will winter kill. And then the spaces between the rows would be a cover crop like rye or sorghum sudan, or perhaps a mix of grass and legumes, which will have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you're busy building organic matter between the rows while right within the row, um, you're encouraging crop nutrition, you're encouraging that active organic matter turnover. Okay, this is the challenge. Monitoring your soil organic matter. How do you know if you're making progress? And what I would say is, first, don't get too wrapped up. Don't get too stuck on this one or worried about it. Because if you're doing a good job out there, even if your soil test shows like you've lost two tenths of a percent of organic matter, if you can visually see that your field is continuing to improve and you've kept it covered most of the year and you're taking good care of it, not over tilling, you're likely making progress or at least maintaining a high level of soil health. But let's go ahead and look at some of this. Total soil organic matter, that's the percent SOM that you do in your soil test report. Um, most soil test reports do a pretty decent job. They'll either do a loss on ignition or they'll do a wet chemistry method for total organic matter. Um, however, be aware that a few labs will do something called humic matter. Uh, this is an older extraction method uh, where the soil is subjected to a strong alkali and then there's certain fractions of the organic matter that are measured. To some extent, this is a, an artifact of the extraction method. And um, I can say from experience, uh, the one lab that I have encountered that uses the North Carolina State Department of Agriculture, the main use of their humic matter is to help conventional farmers determine how much herbicide to use because high High humic soils will tend to bind it up and they need higher rates, but it's not that relevant to organic producers because we're dealing with many different fractions of organic matter, all of which are important, which have vital functions out in the field. So anyway, uh, the good news is that the total soil organic matter measured by these standard methods, uh, loss on ignition or dry combustion or even some of the wet chemistry, have been shown to be a very good um, 
index of soil health. However, there are a couple of caveats to consider. One is total soil organic matter um, moves very slowly with changes in management so that um, you can improve your management greatly and then five, it may take five or 10 years before you say, oh, finally my soil test has gone up a half a percent. That's actually a pretty good accomplishment. Here's some things to consider. Um, the best integrated organic systems, as we heard earlier, might add about a thousand pounds of organic matter per acre per year. Uh, good management intensive grazing might add several thousand pounds. And when you take 10 tons of compost per acre, which is a rate that you don't want to use every year uh, in most circumstances because of the nutrient issues, that'll add one or two tons of stable organic matter per application. Now, if you're looking at a soil test of the top eight inches of soil, it has to accrue 10 tons of soil organic matter to, to move the top soil, soil organic matter percentage on the soil test uh, by one percentage unit, like up from a 2.0 to a 3.0. And there's a lot of random variability, like you can take two samples and do it as carefully as you can, and you send them into that lab. One will come back 2.0, one will come back 2.5 or 2.7. So it's hard to distinguish over the short term. Another thing to remember is all of these soil tests look at the top six or eight inches at best. And a lot of what's going on, more than half of the world's soil carbon is sequestered below 12 inches. And that's also important for, for soil quality at depth. Um, and there's a lot of biology going down there, although it's less concentrated than the surface. Another thing to remember about total soil organic matter is that you need to look at it in the context of your soil type, your soil texture, and your climate. Like if uh, down here in the southeastern United States, if you're farming a coastal plains loamy sand in South Carolina and your soil organic matter is 2%, I would say how did you do it? That is stupendous. I mean, you have incredible soil health there. And if I found 2% in Iowa, one of their, you know, uh, silty clay loams that have six feet of topsoil from, you know, millennia of prairie, and they're down to 2%, I said, my God, have you ever heard of cover cropping? Because that is extremely low for up there. So if you're looking on a sandy soil in a warm climate, you're up around 2%, you're doing good. If you're on a loamy soil and a cooler climate, you might want to be looking more like around 5%. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. There are some tricks to interpreting soil organic, soil organic matter. It is a good long-term indicator. Like if you've been farming for 10 years, then you look back and you say, is the trend level? Is the trend creeping up or is it actually creeping down? There are other measures of soil health and uh, soil function uh, and soil organic matter that are, that are very useful. Um, this active fraction of organic matter, including both the uh, organisms themselves and uh, their immediate byproducts, microbial biomass. Now, that's something not something a farmer can just go out and easily measure in the field, but it is a very useful research tool um, and a strong correlation with both to total organic matter and various soil functions. There are a number of microbial enzymes, one of which reflects just basically respiration, overall activity, others related to nitrogen cycling phosphorus cycling, even sulfur cycling. A um, lot of very interesting data there. Microbial respiration, sometimes called potentially mineralizable carbon. There is a simple Solvita soil test that can address that. Uh, permanganate oxidizable soil carbon. This is one of several protocols to measure what's called active soil organic matter, or active soil carbon. Um, there are several others. One simply particulate carbon, which is sand-sized particles that are rich in organic matter, the carbon content of those. Uh, there is also um, an older procedure that's related to this um, humus concept or humic matter concept. It's called fulvic acid. Um, although the fulvic acid itself may be an ex uh, artifact of extraction, it does give a valuable, um, fairly useful uh, indicator of your active organic matter. It turns out that uh, permanganate oxidizable soil organic matter uh, is very good for reflecting the process of stabilization. Even though it's an active phase of organic matter, it's showing how effectively the microbes are growing and producing stable organic matter. While the, the uh, respiration or the potentially mineralizable carbon, that reflects the effect efficacy of the organisms in mineralizing organic matter and feeding your crop. 
both are actually measured by very simple lab procedures and a farmer that may be able to invest in uh, field tools to do these or get a lab to do them for not too much uh, expense. They're also highly correlated with crop yields because again, both of these processes are very, very important. So some early indicators of improving organic matter, uh, a stu 56 studies around the world, the microbial biomass in the organic systems are 40% higher, various enzyme activities 30 to 80%, and the total organic matter went up 19%, which is much smaller, but that shows, again, that these other indicators lead the total organic matter. Uh, a, compa a comparison of uh, 600 more than 600 organic fields and more than 700 conventionally managed fields across the U.S., this fulvic acid fraction, uh, they were using the older um, extraction procedure, it jumped 150% under organic management, while the total organic matter only went up 13%. So what this tells me is that, what this tells us is that when you have um, good organic management and your organic matter inches up a little bit, and especially if your eyes tell you that your crops are doing great and the soil is easy to work, the improvements you have achieved is much larger than that small organic matter increase. Uh, similar comparisons between microbial biomass and total organic matter in comparison to organic versus conventional in a single trial. And then also comparison of crop rotation versus monoculture. And this one's very interesting. Simply diversifying your crop rotation without even intensifying necessarily. It's going corn, soy instead of corn or corn soy wheat instead of corn soy, you get a bump in microbial biomass and a little bump in organic matter. <clears throat> so uh, another way to assess soil health is these so-called scorecards, which you can get from your local NRCS office in some states. And there's two uh, lab tests. One is the Cornell Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health. One is the Haney Soil Health Test. Both of these use a large number of physical chemical and biological parameters of soil health. Are your nutrients in optimum range? That's the chemical aspect. Um, is it good? Do you have good soil tilth? Um, does it does it absorb moisture well or does it pond? Is there a hard pan at some point? Those are the physical aspects. And the biological aspects would be things like microbial biomass, permanganate, oxidizable carbon, or uh, respiration. The Haney soil test combines several of these to estimate uh, soil uh, nutrient uh, cycling, which is a vital function of healthy soil. The problem is these um, these various soil health indices are very region specific. The Cornell test worked great for a study uh, conducted by Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, looking at how organic farms affected soil health, and they showed that the scores went up when you did organic agriculture. Uh, the Haney test works great in Texas. It tells Texan farmers how well their, their um, soils are processing nutrients and releasing them to plants. But in North Carolina, there was a study of various systems, uh, both or organic and non-organic, conventional till and reduced till. And both of these tests fell on their face because the Cornell test said all your systems have terrible soil health. And the Haney test said all your systems have great soil health. Reason is... The Texas was designed for very hot, semi-arid climates. The uh, Cornell was designed for cool climates, and this was being done in a warm, humid climate. So uh, that is a limitation. The other limitation is that these protocols are labor-intensive, and I know even as a home gardener that farmers probably don't have the time to mess with them <laughs> for the most part. So let's just take a simpler and more direct approach. Uh, coming up the end of the time, but I'll try to get through this quickly. Um, just go out there and look at your field. Get to know your soil. Get to know what its inherent properties are. And I'll get to that in a minute, how you do that. Uh, know that its strengths and weaknesses, as well as its past management history. Uh, and then make your own field observations each year. Things like, uh, is it getting easier to till the soil? Is Has there been a hard pan and is it easing? Is the soil getting richer and darker brown in color? Are you got, Do you have a lot of earthworms? How are the crops doing? What happens when it doesn't rain for a week? Do your crops wilt or do they keep growing or they hang in there until the drought's over? Um, and then you do want to look at your standard soil test. They're really good for tracking uh, pH, phosphorus, potassium, and other nutrient levels, and your long-term soil organic matter trends. 
Uh, if you find that a test like the uh, permanganate oxidizable carbon or the uh, Solvita test for soil respiration are useful, by all means do them um, and just keep records. Okay, the NRCS Web Soil Survey is an excellent tool for getting to know your soil. I started to use this in my consulting, and I just feel like it's really helped me understand what uh, the uh, farmers I'm working with are working with. Because it used to be I look at a soil, and I said, this is terrible soil. What the heck have you been doing with it? And the question is often answered, oh, this is a poorly drained soil. No wonder. Or this has a natural hard pan. Or this is a very sandy soil, so it's really good to understand. Look up your site on the soil web survey, and it'll show you a soil map, give you lots of data, even the fragility of the soil, whether the soil is inherently fragile and how you might better manage it. Uh, next thing is just go out, look at the field, and look. Is the soft, is this topsoil nice and soft and crumbly? Do you see visible aggregates, or is it kind of hard and cloddy, or is it just single grains? Is it like sand, or is it crusted? And is it dark and rich brown, or is it a lighter tan or a reddish brown? And one thing to remember is that, um, again, even that's going to be site site specific. I've seen a lot of reddish soils here in the southeast that that are quite decent health. They'll have four percent organic matter, and they'll have very good crops. And that's because we are in a different uh, region and different soil types here than, uh, say, Iowa. It's good to dig down, if, uh, if dig a few holes in your field or to take a probe and just go down 12, 18 inches, see what's down there. If you've got a sandy topsoil, you might have a nice clay loam subsoil that's holding uh, nutrients. You might hit a hard pan and it's time to grow some heavy, uh, deep rooted cover crops or perhaps chisel plow. Does rain or irrigation water soak in quickly or does it tend to run off? Um, and do you see plenty of earthworms? Okay. Another thing is to look at your crops. Uh, now, to be fair, that one on the right has a type of disease that just hits cucurbits, whether your soil is good or not. But if your soil has got health problems, you are more likely to see health problems in your crops. What's really instructive is to dig up some plants. Look at the roots. If they're extensive and deep and they're healthy colored, uh, that indicates good soil health. Um, if you see a white fuzz on another way, it's healthy root and it kind of extends out, that might be mycorrhizae and maybe a beneficial fungus, nothing to worry about. But if your roots are kind of slimy and restricted and black, you definitely have some issues. Okay, that's, I ended right at the hour and we're ready for questions. Okay, well done. Yeah, it's 11, it's 11.59 here on the Pacific Coast. And um, if you have a question, um, you're welcome to type it into the Q&A box, and um, then I will read as many as I can um, between now and the next 30 minutes or so. Um, I also wanted to mention, since a number of people asked, that yes, we did record this presentation, and we're going to make it available <coughs> within the next week or two at the most on the eOrganic YouTube channel, and we're going to do that with all the webinars in this series. So if there's something you missed or you want to share it or you want to see it again, um, you'll be able to find them on the eOrganic YouTube channel as well as on the extension.org website. Um, finally, I just wanted to ask if you could all fill out the follow-up survey that we send after the webinar by email. We would be very grateful. So I'm, I'd like to move on to some questions. Um, we had one question about how much compost is too much. How can you, how can you know that? Um, this is Mark. I could try to address that. I can't give you a formula. Um, it depends on your current soil condition and on your soil test. Like if I'm working with a farmer who's transitioning to organic and they've got a very dead looking soil, there's a bad hard pan and it's obviously a low organic matter, I want to get a soil test first. Um, and if it's low in phosphorus and potassium and he or she has a good source of good quality compost, I'll say you do 10, 20, even 30 pound tons per acre as a one time application to jump start the soil. And then you would go into growing cover crops. If your phosphorus is already high, uh, remember that crop harvests only remove maybe 10 pounds of phosphorus per acre per year or 20 to 25 pounds of phosphate, P2O5. And if your compost is 1% phosphorus, 1% uh, phosphate, then a ton per acre would be giving you 20 pounds of phosphate. And so you may want to limit it to one ton per acre or do five tons per acre every four or five years. So it varies a lot with where your soil is. 
and you just want to watch the soil test trends, uh, you may find that um, you could be applying several tons per acre and your phosphorus holds steady in the optimum range, and that's what you want. And also, it depends on what you need and also what you can afford. Uh, small, intensive uh, vegetable farms tend to use much higher rates of compost and sometimes run the risk of building up nutrient excesses uh, because vegetables do respond to the, to the nutrient-rich compost, and it's very tempting to just put it on and keep putting it on. Um, anyway, good question. Uh, complicated answer. Uh, it's basically uh, all, it's very site-specific. Oh, another thing I want to add is that some composts are much lower uh, in phosphorus and you could probably, or, or in nutrients, and they may be a good source of organic matter without overloading nutrients, and you could use them at somewhat higher rates. Yeah, okay. We have a questioner from the San Joaquin Valley, and um, he s says he gets about six, and six to seven inches of rain a year or so, and um, there are some water management laws there in place. And so um, he was wondering um, whether it would make sense to have a year-round um, cover crop in that kind of area. Oh, wow. That is a challenging environment. At six to seven inches um uh rain per year. Uh, I am not familiar with uh, those kind of dry conditions. I can say this, though, that in areas of North and South Dakota, where they're getting perhaps 10 to 20 inches a year, um, and it is a cooler climate, semi-arid, uh, where it's traditional to grow wheat fallow, there have been numerous studies that have shown much better soil health and sustained or improved crop yields if that land is cropped annually, and, and even when high biomass, high diversity cover crops are grown, uh, to be sure, uh, especially if you're to, uh, doing dry land farming in that uh, San Joaquin Valley situation, uh, we'll need to adapt this whole approach. Uh, and I don't really know the answer to that. It's an area of research that is ongoing. There's quite a bit of dry land organic ag research. If you're talking about irrigated vegetable production, I would venture to say that growing cover crops may save you water in the long run, even though the crops are consuming water, because you're greatly improving the soil's water holding capacity. And therefore, you may not need as much irrigation water to grow your vegetable, even though you've used up some of the rain to grow the cover crop. Let's see. If you are looking at data for soil health parameters for the first time with a producer, do you have advice on what parameters to focus on and what to suggest for them in terms of retesting in three to five years? Um, the standard soil test works pretty well for that. And I would go back, if, if the farmer wants to get into a little more depth, I would maybe look into the Solvita soil test. You can actually get a kit. And I believe that permanganate oxidizable carbon, there is, there may also be a kit available for that. Uh, I would have to look online to be uh, to see if there's one that is actually in general use or whether it's still kind of a research um, uh, item. It's definitely uh, that's definitely a, a cutting edge question. Um, if you have a, a soil health scorecard designed for your state or your region, that may be worth using. Just do it every couple of years. And there's just some field procedures, and then actually some of it does depend on the standard soil test, you know, determine whether your phosphorus and other nutrients are staying in optimum range or are perhaps slipping out. Okay. What cover crops might you recommend to provide natural weed control via allelopathy? Ah, another good question. Uh, the more I read and research, the more I put the direct competition aspects of cover crops ahead of allelopathy, although there is some allelopathy. Uh, so I would just answer that in terms of what cover crops are really good for weed control. Tillage radish um, covers the ground really quickly and it casts a very dark green shade. And I used to think, uh, matter of fact, many people used to think it was powerfully allelopathy because of all the glucosinolates and such. And I was trying to figure out why I could grow vegetables the spring after at when the fall planted winter killed radish crop really suppressed weeds well into the spring. I thought, well, that's like nature's paraquat. How can I grow anything here? And everything grew fine. In fact, the spinach was great. Turns out that it's not allelopathy, it's the shade. But anyway, um, sorghum sudan grass for the summer and the winter rye for the winter, they combine competitive 
growth with some allelopathy, which has definitely been shown to have activity against at least some of the annual weeds. In fact, the interesting thing about sorghum sedan grass is it's effective against uh, uh, Canada thistle, both allelopathic and uh, the competition. Um, anything that forms a quick canopy, uh, cowpea is good in the summer, soybean is pretty good. Um, in the cooler season, uh, we're probably looking at a combination of a, a, a winter cereal grain and a, and a, uh, a legume. Uh, on lower fertility soils, pearl millet is highly recommended. It tolerates a low fertility, and it's a very high biomass uh, uh, cover crop that uh, will really keep the weeds down. Another thing is to combine two or three cover crops with differing architecture, like cow pea and pearl millet are going to be much more effective than either one alone because one forms a spreading dark green canopy and the other grows very tall. Um, same for rye and veg. I've seen really good weed control of rye plus veg, whereas either rye alone or veg alone, uh, certain weeds are able to came, come through, different weed species. Uh, so that's another good approach, just combining several dissimilar cover crops. And I will add that we are going to be doing a webinar on cover crops. And another one on weeds. And another one yeah. on weeds, right. Yeah, hopefully everybody has registered for more than one webinar. Um, we have quite a few. We have nine altogether in this series, so um, you're welcome to join us for all the next ones as well. Um, let's see. This person has a Haney soil health calculation index of 17 on his Iowa farm soil. Would that be considered healthy? I am not familiar with that index. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have to hit the, the, the internet and see what I could find. Okay. All right. Um, when building new multi-vegetable gar garden beds in fallow soil, should soil testing be done prior to bed building or after tillage and bed prep? I like to test before the tillage, um, just to test it in situ. Um, or you'd be consistent. If you, if, you, if you do test after tilling, then make it a regular habit to test after you're tilling, because the tilling will shift things a little bit. And since it's really good to work towards reducing tillage for soil health, and we'll have another one, another webinar on tillage, um, your tillage practices will tend to evolve over time. So it's probably good to just come in uh, with your soil test either in the fall or the spring, but before any tillage happens. Okay. Um, one of your slides showed the benefits of soil organic matter. Are these benefits the same for both active organic matter and more stable organic matter? Well, they serve complementary roles. A lot of them overlap. Uh, both active and stable organic matter will encourage, will improve soil structure, although through slightly different mechanisms. They both improve fertility through very different mechanisms. The active organic matter, as it breaks down, it releases those nutrients that are an integral part of organic compounds. Those would be nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and some of the micronutrients. And the stable organic matter contributes cation exchange capacity, so it will hold potassium, calcium, magnesium, and ammonium, and some micronutrients against leaching. The active organic matter is, provides food for the soil life, the stable organic matter more tends to provide habitat because it improves the soil structure. Actually, both improve the soil structure, and that creates the pore space in which the critters need, need to have space to live. And there are many subtle functions uh, of both types of organic matter. And stable organic matter is itself a combination of different forms. Uh, some of them are stable only because they're adsorbed to soil minerals or they are held inside of ab aggregates or they're very deep in the soil profile. So if you went through and tilled and broke up aggregates, and especially if you took a moldboard plow and brought some of that deep organic matter to the surface, it'll shift from stable to active because it was stabilized physically. There is some small percentage of the organic matter that is actually chemically stabilized. Um, and then there is that which is uh, so tightly adhered to uh, uh, clays in the soil that it will be remain stable even after a disturbance. So um, it's kind of a complex answer to a very good question, <laughs> and I hope it was helpful. 
Okay, here's, a, here's an interesting question. My neighbor uses herbicides and synthetic fertilizer, and I would like to encourage him to farm organically. Would you recommend any particular handout or book or website that best explains the benefits of organic soil management? Oh, well, you could start with the uh, written guides for this series. Um, there is a really good book called... Um, Building Soils for Better Crops. It's available through the uh, SARI program, US, USDA's uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education program. You can uh, actually download it for free or you can purchase it for about 20 bucks, probably 25 by now, but uh, still quite affordable. Uh, um, there are other ones. Oh, uh, eOrganic, which is the... Um, which is hosting this uh, webinar, uh, has a uh, organic resource area on the Extension website. And there is a number of, um, a large number of articles on soil and nutrient uh, management uh, that will, uh, will give some of that information. But I, I see you're asking for a more, kind of a more basic level. I'm trying to think where the best place to start would be. Uh, maybe you can help me here, Diana. Well, the like uh, Mark suggested, uh, the the guides are on our website and downloadable, or you can get them uh, in in hard copy if you want. And they, the at least the beginning one, what we've gone over today is is pretty basic and um, and covers a lot of the bases. Um, and we have extensive uh, other publications and just articles on our website that you might want to go through that that uh, links to soil health. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the uh, ATRA uh, all is a sustainable ag library that you can go to, ATTRA, I think it's .org, um, that ha you can ask them uh, specific for specific articles or, or just give them a question and they will give you references and, and they are a service of USDA um, that you can do online. Okay, yeah, we have links right up on the screen here to both the eOrganic website where we have our upcoming and archived webinars, and um, there's a lot of articles on that website as well in different topics that are organized right on the screen there with the webinar um, schedule. And then the soil guide link is right below that. So I have several more questions, or many more questions actually. Um, do you know of any research on the benefits of high mulching flail cutting on soil health in pasture versus conventional grazing? Uh, I mean, I, you're talking about the mob grazing, uh, the high intensity. Uh, there is a, a newsletter by the Northeast Organic Farming Association, and a few years ago they had uh, they had one on on grazing, and it uh, cited some uh, some studies there that showed these uh, large benefits, and uh, a lot of very uh, convincing rat, uh, farmer rancher story success stories. Okay. And, yeah, there are a number of books out there. There's one by Joel, uh, several by Joel Salatin here in Virginia. Uh, Alan Savory has written a number of books. Uh, and I think that uh, there's probably others, but I don't, I can't think of them right off the top of my head. Okay, here's a question about nematodes. Um, do nematodes live in more organic soil? Or I guess maybe she's asking, do more nematodes live in organic soil? If you're asking about total numbers of nematodes, uh, they will go up as soil health improves. If you're asking about pest nematodes, their numbers will tend to decline as your soil health improves, but their importance as in their impact on plants will drop steeply because they become a very small percentage of your ne nematode population. Now, it's not impossible to have nematode problems on your crops in a relatively healthy soil. Uh, or a high organic soil, uh, because sometimes it, any soil will have a specific microbiome and a, a specific community of uh, nematodes, and they may be very healthy for some crops and not quite so good for others. Uh, or there may be a, slight, a subtle imbalance in the soil food web so that a certain undesirable nematode is present in large numbers. But as a general rule, um, root feeding or pest nematodes are the biggest problems in warm humid climates with sandy soils and very low organic matter. And building the soil will, on the whole, in general, reduce pest nematode problems 
And meanwhile, your total nematode populations will be going up, and that's a good thing because the beneficial nematodes are very important for nutrient cycling. Okay. Um, does adding biochar to your soil increase organic matter? And if so, is it an economical way to increase organic matter? Oh, big question. <laughs> <laughs> and I would refer you to the, to the NOFA website again. There is a whole issue on uh, biochar. Uh, it was written in the last few years. Uh, and in fact, ATRA is producing an updated um, bulletin on biochar, the pros and cons. Uh, because the rates that are typically effective in crop and soil health are around 10 tons per acre, it's probably most feasible on very small scale. Uh, what biochar is, is it's black carbon um, resulting from partial uh, burning of biomass under oxygen limited conditions. And the interesting thing is that nature has done this in prairies. Like when you have these uh, periodic prairie fires that are not especially hot, they just sweep through real quickly and they burn off the top growth, they'll turn some of the plant crown into basically biochar or black carbon. And what happens to black carbon is it is very stable. About At least half of it will be persisting for that centuries to millennia range. And it ages, it gradually changes from just plain carbon, like charcoal, into a more oxidized uh, form, which has lots of cation exchange capacity. And it is chemically stabilized organic matter, and it will tend to stick around. And in fact, prairie soils, uh, up to half of their very high organic matter may be black carbon. So um, the big caveat with biochar as an amendment is that if it gains a lot of popularity and there's a lot of demand for it at rates of five and ten tons per acre, how you get biochar industrially is to burn biomass. Now, if you're going to a garbage dump and keeping food waste out of the, out of the um, landfill and turning it into biochar, you're saving the atmosphere a lot of methane and you're turning a nasty waste into a valuable product. If you're doing the same to lagoon manure, great. But there are industries that are going into uh, uh, developing countries and taking native ecosystems and raising the forest or the prairie there and burning that biomass to make biochar for uh, growers in this country. And that is a huge uh, both uh, natural resource and even social justice concern. So uh, I would say check your sources. Uh, and some, some farms are making their own biochar right on site with, with, with waste. And that is one way to manage waste. It's like compost is a way to manage uh, organic residues. I shouldn't even use the word waste there. None of this stuff is waste until it goes into a landfill or a lagoon and becomes a, a, a pollution issue. Um, yeah, a complicated answer. <laughs> Again. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this person works for an organic farm and they recently purchased some property that had a lot of Roundup residue. Do you know of any cover crops or anything that can be applied that would help eliminate the Roundup residue left over from the previous farmer? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, you are dealing with a soil health problem and that very high levels of Roundup do upset the soil food web. The good news is that Roundup is not super, super persistent. Its persistence is moderate. And my guess is that you can heal a soil from Roundup applications just as you can heal a soil from excessive tillage and compaction. It'll take a few years. Um, the symptoms of improvement will be improving plant growth because plants can't, not very few plants can grow around Roundup. <laughs> so, um, all I can say is just apply the principles covered in this webinar and in the in the uh, soil guides. Uh, and of course, if you are converting that land to organic, it will be the three-year waiting period before you can uh, enroll it as organic. And you may also have to further verify that those residues have disappeared. It is my understanding that, that Roundup tends to get bound up to the soil and then gradually decompose, um, which is why you can spray Roundup and then grow any crop you want the next year because it's inactivated as an herbicide. Okay, um, let's see. Here's a question about um, what you might suggest for organic amendments in addition to compost because this person just still doesn't have that much compost. Oh, um, 
I would say look around what your local resources are. Uh, there's nothing wrong with fresh organic residues. Uh, you can either compost them on site or you can actually add them directly to the soil. Again, keeping in, that mind, keeping in mind that balance between the nitrogen and the carbon. The only other caveat is if you're using unprocessed manure, raw manure or uh, slaughterhouse waste or anything that's putrescible and could carry uh, human foodborne pathogens, just allow at least 120 days between the time you dig that into your soil or plow it in or, or uh, till it in and your next food harvest. Uh, that's a very good rule of thumb of uh, food uh, safety uh, guideline. Um, if you lack finished compost and you have low soil biological activity, you can um, also buy commercial soil inoculants. Uh, I would get one that's diversified, has a mixture of different organisms, a couple that are available through a local vendor, Seven Springs Farm. One is called InocuCore, uh, which is uh, several organisms that together tend to help balance and stimulate the soil food web. Uh, another one is called Vermiplex. It includes a diversity of beneficial bacteria and fungi, including the mycorrhizal. Um, what these are doing is they're filling one of the functions of finished compost. Uh, compost tea is another one, or verm, uh, vermicomp worm castings tea. Any of these uh, materials, actually Vermiplex is a worm castings tea. Um, yeah, any of, so you could use that in, in combination with any residues. If you have uh, municipal leaves, especially if they've broken down a little bit, that's a good way to, to build your soil. Uh, but do try to get a mixture of things and uh, use them as a complement to uh, fertility growing in place with your cover crops or your sod or whatever. Okay. Uh, um, let me sorry. Yeah, a quick ahead. add to that. Uh, uh, municipal, uh, a lot of times if you're in an urban farming, gardening situation, they do collect the leaves um, and they will uh, either give or at a minimal cost uh, them back to you either composted or uh, just as, as litter. Um, but a lot of, uh, you might want to contact uh, landscaping companies that come in and cut down trees, because uh, even wood bark, if you just want a, a top coating, uh, pine needles can be used, but they are acidic, so you have to, to recognize that, uh, the nutrient and pH there. Uh, so there, there can be sources from, from these types of commercial uh, vendors uh, that you can get uh, some some compost, or at least the, the raw materials from. <clears throat> okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, I had a question just a moment ago. I've got to find it up again. Um, okay, yeah, um, can you recommend, you may have covered this, but um, how someone can get their soil tested for microbial activity? Um, I think the Solvita lab does that. Uh, there are some labs that will, will uh, do at least the respiration test. Um, you might check with your uh, with, with the land grant university in your state, see if they can give you some leads, uh, especially in certain states where there's been a lot of organic research. Um, I don't know, Diana, do you know the answer to that? Are, are there commercial labs uh, that do? Yeah, most of the commercial labs, uh, you can, it's a type of, it's not the, the general uh, test, you would have to request that, but uh, I think the easiest source would be ca call your extension service, uh, or your, uh, most land grant universities have their own uh, soil testing uh, facilities for their state. Uh, uh, the normal test uh, is at a minimal or no cost, so microbial would, would be at a, a small charge. Uh, and if they don't do it in their in their state labs, then they certainly would be able to tell you a commercial lab to go to. And every state does this pretty much through their university system. Okay, um, we had a question uh, about um, how one of the presenters, I believe it was Mark, gave some examples of some farmers who increased their soil organic matter percentage over time. Can you talk about those again? Because um, he wants to write them down. Um, I don't actually have the name right off the tip of my tongue, but that well, the one that I that we did talk about was the farmer in New York who uh, implemented management intensive grazing, um, and that was an unusually dramatic response. The total soil organic matter inched up from two point eight to four point zero percent, which represents a lot of organic matter. Um, the others were multiple. Uh, the other examples I discussed 
were what are called meta-analyses. These are a, a review of multiple research trials around the world or around the United States. At one case, it was like 600 different um, conventionally managed fields and 600 different organically managed fields that were, were also evaluated just for their total organic and their active organic matter. Um, I'm trying to think of, of more case studies of a specific farm that has seen, that has documented these increases. Oh, go to uh, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, they have been doing, they've been working with about a dozen organic growers around the state and tracking improvements in soil health and soil organic matter is one of the uh, things that has been going up uh, that that has that has responded and and has been uh, uh, tracked. Yeah, that's pasta.org, P-A-S-A dot org. Yeah. Uh, another thing, uh, one thing that Mark and uh, I and, and some of our other staff uh, worked on is the, the Taking Stock, which was a re uh, book, which is the review of all the USDA uh, organic research and so there are citations in there and examples throughout it's quite extensive and that's again on the website if you want to to look that up okay yeah on the organic farming research right. foundation website yeah report called taking stock. taking stock okay yeah so you'd find that under the publications yeah. on your website yeah. okay all right um, yeah I, I would say time. probably yeah. the the uh, uh, the guide on which this uh, webinar is based will provide more practical and accessible information. But uh, if you want to dive deeper, okay. then either look into the resources there or go to the taking stock. Okay, thanks. I think we've got one more question, um, or and time for one more question. I think we've covered most of them here. Um, do you have any thoughts on dealing with cover crops to try to mimic nature as much as possible? <laughs> Well, I'll preface it, Mark, before you answer that we will do a cover crop uh, webinar, so just put a plug in for that. Okay. Right. Well, the cover crop that mimics nature would be whatever your climax vegetation is, and that is a, uh, that's an approach called permaculture, uh, and I would say that's a total cropping system that mimics nature. Here in Virginia, it would be forest gardening, uh, and I think our society has a long way to evolve before we are feeding ourselves um, significantly from forest gardening. Uh, out in the prairie, uh, it would be prairies, and uh, the Land Institute has been working with perennial grains production systems, uh, and one of the universities, I think uh, Michigan State, there was a team that's looking at some perennial wheats as well. Um, short of that, certainly the management intensive grazing systems, especially when done in a prairie or, or semi-arid region, is mimicking nature because when you manage the cattle like that, they behave a lot like the buffalo herds that were here before Europeans came to the new world. Uh, and that is why those systems are so responsive in terms of soil health is because they are close to how the ecosystems evolved. It's a little harder to do that with annual crops. Uh, but the more you keep your soil covered, and especially if you have the capacity to integrate a perennial sod phase into your rotation, you're already a heck of a lot closer to natural systems than you were at the um, doing corn, soy, wheat with no cover crops, or even vegetables with no cover crops, because there you have a whole bunch of very low residue crops not returning that much root uh, exudate or uh, biomass to the to the soil. Um, simply adding the cover crop is you're taking this big step in the right direction. Okay, thank you. I think we are now officially out of time, but thank you all for your excellent questions, and we hope to have you with us for the next eight webinars in this series over the next year or so. So thank you so much, Mark and Diana, and um, we will be speaking to you soon at the next webinar. Right. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.